Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast, formerly known as the Game Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Thompson. Here with me, as always, is Brian Gottlieb. No special names anymore. We killed them. Many things changing this week, including the death of the names. Jerry, you didn't deliver that with the excitement and fervor I wanted you to have. That's the first time you're introducing our new cast. You have to, you have to come intense, man. Shout it out. Arena Deckless Podcast. We're pumped. I Well, I just wanted to set up for the future where I just keep it consistent throughout, you know? Oh, okay. So you're just setting the precedent now. Yeah, I don't want excitement to wane. Okay. Okay. So start low and build up over time is what you're saying? Nah, keep it the same, man. Keep it the same. So Okay, never change. Love it. Yeah, uh, never change in the podcast where we are talking about how and why we rebranded. So that's mm-hmm. great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> basically, when I started this podcast with Andrew Brown and Michael Majors, we just kind of did it as a passion thing. Like we wanted to talk about magic more. We wanted to talk about magic together. And we definitely did not expect it to get this far. And I I think that is true for Andrew and Michael as well, who just abandoned the podcast to go work for Wizards of the Coast. So Brian has been on the cast for a very, very long time, and it it was just time for a change. Uh, Our name was nonsensical, had very little to do with anything, really, and was very difficult to find. And now with MTG Arena, we figured... Why not actually change it up, try and get in some of those players who are likely going to be very new, looking for some content, and wanted to change the podcast to have something with Arena in the title so that it was actually findable in case you were actually looking for magic content. So if you are new, welcome. Yeah, certainly props to all the people who kind of helped build us up as a pillar of the magic content community, but... It's, it was really just kind of dumb luck. Like it was one of the worst names for a podcast possible. It contained a misspelling right in it. So you could never find it. Yo, it was misspelled on purpose. I, I know. I, I know. And it was great for what it was and the time when we used it. And I think we made the most of it. And, and certainly there's parts of me that are going to miss being the game podcast. You know, I love all of our goofy catchphrases and I love uh, referring to our listeners as we don't even call them anything actually right we we don't tie that one back to the game in any way but you know certainly we've become infamous I think in this space and it was just time for a new chapter it's time to turn the page for all the reasons you said I think it's important that all of our new comrades coming into the arena ecosystem know where to go for the hottest in arena content and the hottest in all forms of magic content. And we just kind of hit this gold mine too. Well, I shouldn't say we, it's entirely your project with the arena deckless Twitter page where we have somehow become the source for new deck technology on the internet. It feels like, and why not capitalize on that and get people involved with sharing decklist there and getting the hottest new tech from the arena deckless Twitter page as well. Right. So As you may have surmised, despite Arena being in the title, it is not going to be explicitly just standard or limited or uh, whatever weird format they have. Like Everything is going to stay the same, basically, for the podcast itself. Only the name is changing. And I don't know, we've we've tried a bunch of different things over the years, I guess. It has been multiple years at this point. Yeah, years now. And I, I think we're still going to experiment with different outlines for the shows and stuff. We've had a few extra guests on somewhat recently, which I think has also been cool. I think people do enjoy that. And I think that, you know, there's still a lot of stuff that we haven't really checked off yet that I would actually like to try out. So, you know, th- yeah. things will be changing just only as much as they were before. Yep. I I think all the projects we always wanted to do, um, they could still happen under this umbrella. And uh, we're happy people are along on the journey with us for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm super thankful for all the listeners, all the patrons, all the people who just help, you know, popularize this cast through word of mouth and everything. Just super thankful for that. And we really do appreciate it. It does keep us going. And I think this is going to help, you know, grow the podcast and get us to the next step, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Always trying to expand our family and get more people to benefit from the efforts we put in every week. And hopefully this is just another step on that path. Oh, yeah. 
So more of the same standard. You have an MCQ this weekend at Mox Boarding House. What are you going to play? Oh, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. I, I wish I knew. I, I immediately fell back into the old form of like classic PTQ season of not ending up with enough time on the week before feeling like I just need a couple more days to figure it out, knowing that I'm not going to have that couple more days and feeling a little lost. I mean, I, I think I have a good understanding of the format. I just am not quite sure how to attack it right now. And everything that I think people are currently hyped up on has its flaws. There's no perfect deck out there. And most of the time there won't be, let's be honest. That's not generally not how this works, but that's always your goal, right? You're always trying to have the best possible options. And everywhere I turn, I see weaknesses and I would love to come to a place where I feel a step ahead. I'm not there yet. I do have some ideas though, but I, I mean, why don't I pick your brain for a little bit first before I put forth the final options I'm considering? How do you see things evolving in the aftermath of SCG Richmond, which you and I, of course, covered, got to see firsthand and just got to see Mono Red kind of stomp, honestly. Yeah, Mono Red crushed it. They beat up on all of the Simic Nexus decks. And I'm not sure. I I think every tournament this weekend is just going to vary so much. Like, I don't know if people are going to look at the results and be like, oh, like Mono Red is obviously the best deck, or if they're going to look at those results and just jam a bunch of Bell Haunts and Oath of Kayas into their already existing Esper decks, or if people are just going to ignore it and just be like, hey, I, I like Simic Nexus. I'm just going to you know keep playing this because a lot of people who are good keep saying that it's good. Given that it is really difficult to predict what is actually going to happen, if I were playing this weekend, I would just play Esper Midrange because I've basically been playing it all week and I have a list that I really like. My article on the deck will be up on Star City Games on Monday, which is a little late, I know. Blame Cedric for that. But for you, I think that you should play Esper Control and I don't think it's particularly close because I I think you would play Esper Control just like perfectly, just like picking it up cold. And I don't think that you've played much with the Esper midrange decks. And I think that it would also just be like a somewhat different style for you. And I do think that Esper control is also just very, very good. I just think that Esper midrange is slightly better against every deck that is not Esper control. So spent a lot of this week with Esper midrange and trying to get to a place of comfort with it. I have my doubts. I I want it to be great because I think it does a lot of the things I want a deck to be doing right now. And one of the big things I am looking for in a deck is what I would term multifaceted pressure. And by that, I mean being able to present more than one body as your offense. I think that's important given the state of Teferi Time Reveler and how omnipresent it is. And if you're not doing that, then you kind of just need to ignore the battlefield in general. And Esper Control checks that box. Simic Nexus checks that box. Surprisingly, I have not talked myself into just playing Simic Nexus. I, I think the deck has some real weaknesses. And I think those weaknesses are being pushed right now by the format even if it's not intentionally, I just think Teferi Time Reveler, Raveler, excuse me, has gotten itself into such a point that while that card is beatable, all your like slam dunk matchups are just gone. They don't exist anymore. Beyond that, there's the specter of mono red. And like you said, it's impossible to, to predict exactly how much of that is going to show up. And despite all these efforts that people are doing to try and make the matchup palatable, I was talking a lot with Kane Reinhardt about how he was approaching the matchup. And he's got this like bond of flourishing thing that he's pretty pleased with, thinks he's made some headway in the mono red matchup. And then I asked him to pin down what he thought his matchup was now at. And he's like, I think it's 40% now after all this work (laughs) I've done. And that's like acceptable. You can go into a tournament with a 40% matchup and be like, okay, this is fine. If you're crushing everything else. And I don't think you are. I think Esper is very close at this point, probably very skill dependent and matchup knowledge dependent. I think the Bant decks are iffy, depending on how they're built. If they're going really hard into Frilled Mystic, it gets much worse. So all these good matchups are gone. I just can't talk myself into Simic Nexus. I want something just super powerful, kind of straightforward. And 
I would love something that just didn't have as greedy of a mana base as so many of these decks. I think the band deck is neat, but just like half the time I can't cast my spells. And that's not really acceptable in the PTQ format where I really just want consistency. I want to play games. I want to make decisions. I want my skill to have a chance to shine. So you mentioned Esper. I think that's a better choice. It does still have some of that issues that sometimes just get locked out of your spells, but not to the same extent as Bant. What I would honestly love to find is a Golgari or Sultai list that I could live with. And by one I could live with, I mean one that probably isn't all that good against Nexus, but is well configured virtually everywhere else. And so if you were to ask me kind of my two front runners as it stands right now, it would be Esper Control or either Golgari or Sultai midrange. I'm not sure if you actually need blue anymore. I think it's possible you could probably get away with green black if you're not going to fix the Simic Nexus matchup anyway. Maybe it's just better to be a lower to the ground, more consistent version of Golgari, but I'm not sure. And I feel like I need more time to figure that out. And any insight you have on those general ideas, I would love to hear right now. I agree that green black doesn't necessarily need the blue anymore because green black has access to a bunch of rad planeswalkers at this point that kind of do the job mm-hmm. that Hydroid Grasses did. I think that Carnage Tyrant is largely unplayable because of all the Liliana Dreadhorde generals. And certainly you'd be playing some amount of them in your deck as well. And then that kind of takes up like this, the six mana slot. Why can't you just play Planeswalkers as opposed to Carnage Tyrant? No, you can. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you, you should just have Liliana instead of Carnage Tyrant. Right. Sure. Uh, the, the only thing that is worse is that, you know, like your fine finalities get a little bit worse. Maybe you trim on those a little bit, but whatever. Right. I, I think that's that's completely fine. And I think that cards like Massacre Girl could potentially make up for the fact that you're playing fewer fine finalities if you're expecting some amount of white aggro decks. The problem with that is that I would want to make Golgari into a small Vivian deck and the best cards are all Planeswalkers. And also, I think that Golgari is probably just worse than Bant. I've run through a lot of this in my head and basically getting to some of these same conclusions. I'm I'm not 100% on the Golgari worse than Bant thing. I think that, again, if we're just talking consistency and like doing your game plan over and over, maybe Gol- Golgari gets the nod. But like, there's a real O-Catcher problem if Bant's going to be a popular deck. Like that is an absolute mirror breaker and you don't have a ton of ways around that. I love that you mentioned Massacre Girl. I think into Bant, that's a really nice option and one that you can use a a few times if you have access to find finality. But yeah, that's a sticking point. I can't really get myself over. I I don't know if you can actually get yourself favored in those matchups. So can I figure this out before we're recording this very late on a Thursday night because I just flew in from Las Vegas. Uh, So I have exactly Friday to figure this out. Also, I need to get cards at some point, which is probably another part of the equation. I have all the cards. Okay, that's good. So we have that checked off. Well, I I don't have like the new cards probably, you know, like Teferi, Narset, whatever, but we we can find those. I should have some of that. Honestly, I I literally just walked in the door, but there was a stack of cards sitting on my desk, uh, mail that's arrived over the last day. And I'm not sure what's here yet, but I may have a lot of that stuff. Smart. uh, Teferi's and Narset and all that stuff. So we'll have to take a look at through what's actually here. Uh, And I'm going to have to use tomorrow to make a decision. And beyond all that, there's the specter of these Planeswalker decks just looming. And I feel like it would be very easy for me to not take them seriously, which is my default reaction. Elder spell. And Elder spell. Sure. Sure. I could Elder spell. And in fact, my Esper list has had an Elder spell on the sideboard. And I've been quite pleased with it. I think it's a totally reasonable card to play. But if no one else is at that point yet, and these Planeswalker decks are actually just secretly super powerful... Right before I started recording, I was I saw a tweet from John Rolf who had a version he was really excited about. Yep, so screen, quite sure screenshot of that. Mm-hmm. And it was based around Sarkin, which I think is a really cool angle to take with these Planeswalker decks. But there's also uh, the Zach Elsick Ben Reagan brew that's been floating around, and people seem pretty hype on it. A lot of people are reaching very high mythic, uh, coming back with glowing reviews. And that's just part of the equation I haven't had time to delve into yet. So I want to understand that a little bit more as we head into Saturday, but all of this is just like a long winded way of saying I'm out of time. And at some point I'm just going to have to make a decision. And the default right now would be Esper control. I have a list. I shared it in my article 
on Wednesday. It was basically a combination of what Edgar and Zach were doing from the SCG Richmond Top 8. I think they both got a lot right. I like Zach's card drawing package a little bit more with two Narset in the main deck. I like Edgar's removal a little bit more. So you kind of mush those together. And I came up with a list I really like that I shared in my article this week. So something like that is my default answer. We'll see if anything crazy changes in the next 24 hours. Yeah, I tried to click on your article earlier, but I don't have my SCG password saved on this computer for some reason. So I will I will look at I will look at it later and critique you. I think you should lock in Esper right now, especially since you're having reservations. I think that Elder Spell is awesome, is a card that people aren't playing very much. Do you think you can play multiple copies? Do you think you can go that far? So I definitely want one in the sideboard. I think it might be time to play two, just because it's so good against Bant, Golgari, the mirror yeah. match. I think having access to one is uh, fine against Simic Nexus just because like Tamiyo is such a big deal and it's cheap. You know, maybe you want D spark instead or whatever, but you, you want probably as many D sparks against them as you could possibly have, you know? Right. Um, so we, we can figure out the finer details. We should figure out a list and then we can look for cards later, man. Like that, that is the correct order of operations. That sounds about right. And of course, we can share that with our patrons over on our Patreon page, which is not changing. You don't have to worry about uh, altering your Patreon subscription or anything like that. We, that'll all stay the same. Uh, it'll just get a new name. So at some point, don't be surprised when that page becomes the Arena Decklist page. Right. And I already posted my Esper midrange deck on the Patreon for people who are interested in that. But why don't Why don't you talk really briefly about what in particular you're doing with that particular build of Esper, because I, th- I think that's interesting too. Just give us the defining features of it as well. We know the core at this point. We know what Esper midrange looks like. What does your build do differently? Everyone's doing it wrong. Esper midrange is green white tokens. And I don't mean like the, the Nick Prince, Zakini, Celestia tokens. I mean like OG green white tokens, like the one that I 15 owed one of the SUGs with, where you basically don't take any aggressive action. Like you don't spew off resources to like get in extra damage or create a slightly more favorable board position. Like all of your cards are super valuable in specific situations to the point where you don't want to like spew off your mortify to kill some random creature to get into points of damage because you might need that mortify later for something else. Basically all you do is sit around. Obviously you, you pressure your opponent when, when available or whatever, but like don't go out of your way to just like spew off resources to get in damage and you just accrue value and eventually bury them because uh, my list has nine planeswalkers, six to fairies, three of each and three Sorens and then uh, four deputy of detentions to go with the Soren. So you play deputy, it's almost certainly going to die and then you can play Soren, get it back, uh, turtle up kind of behind this one, three, have a Soren with one counter on it. Soren is awesome because of all the people playing with like Teferi and Narset and Soren is just so good against them. It's also very good against Ugin where a lot of them have these minuses that leave them kind of just hanging out at one loyalty. And then Soren just comes down and picks them off for free basically. So I I think it is just sit around, gain an advantage, eventually bury them. Obviously that plan doesn't work in game one against Esper control because they have way more card advantage than you do. They have chemistry's insight, search for his cancer, these things that, are really difficult for you to interact with, but all of that changes post board. And then you get to actually level the playing field, except you have like hero and thief of sanity. So they have to keep in crappy removal spells that may or may not be good against your draw. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. I think if there was one sticking point for me with Esper mid range that I just couldn't like work my head around. I very much agree with the idea that it's green, white tokens and passivity is fine and generally you just want to maximize your spell at every juncture and that leads to you eventually accumulating enough resources where winning the game is kind of academic and as soon as i started playing the games in that fashion i started winning a lot more and none of this is to say that my win rate with esper midrange was all that bad it just wasn't inspiring and the tension that kept coming up for me was that you absolutely like need to hit your first five land drops, and then you have nothing to mitigate the flood in the late game, which felt like it was inevitably coming. And so I started with your list that you gave me, and my main changes were to make sure I had six mana Planeswalkers. And I just thought like something like Liliana was too valuable not to have in the main deck. 
I know that's not something you agree with. I mean, how would you respond to that criticism of the deck? No, I think that's legit. What I ended up doing actually was going down a land because I definitely felt a lot of the same flooding issue that you did. And one of the ways to mitigate that is just play more big cards, which I think is completely fine. Um, but what I am trying to do currently is not make it so I absolutely have to hit land five on five. Um, if, if I miss my fourth land drop once or miss my fifth land drop once, like that is okay. My curve is reasonably low. I have a bunch of ways to actually interact with my opponent and slow them down and stuff. And I honestly think the answer to that might just ple- be to play the fourth to fairy time raveler it, just because I've been it's, close. it's an early cycler, you know, and I, I think that that sort of thing is huge, but uh, definitely struggling somewhat to figure out the balance of like how many big cards you play and how that affects what your mana base looks like and everything. And I now have search for his Kanta in my sideboard, which is another card that I would just be completely fine playing at least like one copy of main deck. Okay. And you know, that sort of helps like the filtering aspect and just getting you to six mana and stuff like that. So I could see that as, part of the overall package too. I know a lot of people play like discovery dispersal and that's probably how they try and mitigate flood or whatever, but it's just such a bad card for two mana when your deck is already a little bit on the clunky side. It's not like, you know, brainstorm or a preordain or whatever, where you get to like weave it into your turn seamlessly. It's, it's just too clunky and too expensive for the deck. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, I will say that I think your deputy of detention Soren package feels like the way to go forward. Your, it's your so Sorens, good. Your Sorens are much more valuable than the typical version of this deck list. So, and I really like that. I really appreciated Soren's plus two. It's crazy how much that one damage matters and how many situations you play into where it's good. I just can't shake a feeling though that this is not how I maximize my win rate in this format. And that's not to say it's not how you maximize your win rate in this format. It might be exactly the right deck for you. There's something though that's just not quite clicking for me. It doesn't feel like it's doing what I'm looking for. And then I'll be frank, maybe this was a bad run of variants. And judging by the way the deck is composed, it certainly feels that way. But I played so many games without my third color of mana, and they were so frustrating. And that just shouldn't really happen here because you don't have heavy color requirements. You require all colors, but you don't have any heavy color requirements. And things just didn't work out for me over and over and over. And it got to the point where it was really frustrating to the point where I was like considering, what are we doing in this format where we've all started building our decks in this fashion where... (laughs) We just always need to have all three colors of mana. And the Bant decks are just bonkers as far as that goes. Like they're trying to cast Frilled Mystic into Oketra. And half these games I'm playing without any blue sources, much less two blue sources. So I think someone taking a more measured approach to a mana base in Bant might get a lot of success. And in fact, Ken Yukihiro's deck list that he's playing in the MPL this week was something I was super excited about because it's a Bant deck number one, that plays Chamber Sentry. So you're already barking up the right tree for me. But it's taking a more measured approach while still trying to maximize Vivian, which has really been the all-star card in that band deck for me. Like just a huge game changer for these green creature-based decks. Yeah, Vivian's great. One of the things that surprised me, and I, I really don't know why this surprised me initially when people started posting these band deck lists is that they had like 23 land. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, come on, what do you do? Like Salt Eye started out like that too, or Golgari. Or people were just like, well, I have land or elves. And those are the exact same things as land. It's like, no, no, it's not. Like you still want to hit your land drops, even if you have land or elves. And if you cast a land or elf and then, you know, you don't have your second or third land drop, it's like you didn't even play the land or elf, you know? Like you were not capitalizing on that card at all. Like you have to play lands in your decks. And by playing, you know, 24 or 25 land in Bant, you mitigate some of the mana issues that you're going to have just by having more colored sources in your deck overall. And that was kind of what I was doing with the Esper midrange deck where it's where you just have, you know, 26 land. And like I said, now I'm down to 25. I cut the basic island, but. Like that is kind of how you fix mana screw. And there's, it's not like there's anything else you can do past, you know, like the deck plays all the dual lands that it possibly can, right? You're not about to play Demir Guildgate instead of Swamp just because of how heinous it is. Um, But yeah, just add another land if that's your problem. And once you do that, yeah, maybe add some more big cards. 
The first versions of Bant I built were 24 lands, 11 mana creatures. <laughs> like this deck benefits from having all the mana in the world. You're like a Hydroid Crisis Oketra, Oketra deck. You're able to use all of that mana efficiently. You combine that with Vivian and you have all these windows and you snowball the game really effectively. And there's just been less and less mana and fewer and fewer mana creatures as the deck has evolved. And I get it. I get the allure of playing all these creatures which are on their face powerful as opposed to something like Paradise Druid, which, you know, looks really silly in the face of Goblin Chain Whirler. And I'm not even saying go back to Paradise Druid. I don't I don't think it's correct to build the deck that way. I'm just saying my first instinct was that this deck wanted as much mana as humanly possible. Yeah. And my first list came with inspiration from Canister. And I know his list had 12 mana creatures and was basically doing the Oketra uh, Hydroid Crisis thing. So you can you can definitely do it that way and get away with it and just rely on a few powerful spells. Uh, there's probably a happy medium somewhere in between. Like maybe it's time for Incubation Druid to have a bigger role in the deck. But with that deck, I- I'm not willing to give up those games to not casting my spells. I think that's problematic at the PTQ level. And uh, I'm not going to sign up for that this weekend. Although I do think the deck has promise and I think it deserves more attention and a really well-tuned version could certainly be the right choice for this weekend. Yeah, that's part of the problem with playing Bant or even Esper Midrange where a lot of people have been playing these decks, but I don't think they've been tuned within an inch of their life. Whereas I'm reasonably certain that we'll have like 90 or 95% of a good Esper list. Right. Yeah, not as many flex slots there. For control, I mean. Right. I agree. So, I don't know. I I think it is important to note that having all of these Planeswalkers just kind of changes the games in that you very rarely run out of things to do with your mana. So, at that point, just play the extra land and, you know, curve out, do your thing, keep drawing cards. If you find that you are somehow running out of gas or whatever. Like a lot of the Bant decks that the canister was building had a bunch of Planeswalkers at the top end, like Ugin's and uh, Vivian Reed. I know that show was, was or is a uh, number one mythic on the ladder with some Vivian Reeds instead of some Oketras. And I think that's a fine stance to take. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you. Vivian's still excellent. Another reason why I could happily play something like Sultai or Golgari going into this weekend I think the card still has a role, even if the other Vivian is getting all the shine right now. Yeah, they're they're both still great. So whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think you should play Esper Control. I think you should maybe sleep on it or whatever, but just like soft lock it in. We'll talk tomorrow. We'll figure out a list. That sounds good to me. Okay. Modern time. Modern time. This is gonna be a fun conversation to have. Yeah. So you wrote an article on Star City that was uh the top ten cards from War of the Spark that could make their way into modern. Uh, so far, I've seen 16 cards show up in 5-0 Magic Online deck list, and this is just in like the last three events. Yeah, it's it's been wild. It, it's kind of like the most impactful modern set ever. Like, I, I, I realize think, we're I on the cusp. Ever. Yeah, we're, we're on the cusp of Modern Horizons, so I'm assuming that will ultimately take the title away. But as it stands so. right now things have gone absolutely bonkers. Like these lists that are showing up in the deck dumps look nothing like lists we've ever seen before. And I think they're just actually starting to scratch the surface. I think there's a lot more you can do here. Right. The London results just already seem completely irrelevant. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, let's start with the big one. How do you feel about this Neoform card? It's showing up in Devoted Druid, a buddy of mine, Cave Dan, 5 owed with the Adapt Evolve Evolve. Cloudfin Raptor, right? That stuff with like the Pongifies and the Undying stuff, and like that was kind of a budget deck for a little bit. But he had a Neo form to that deck and really likes it. We'll we'll talk about this a little bit later. But Cave Dan also five owed with a Bring to Light Niv Mizzet Reborn deck, so he he likes to brew, you know. Uh, but the other one is Neo form killing people on turn one with Allosaurus Rider. Yeah, we we talked a little bit about this in last week's show, I believe. And certainly this deck loses something leaving the London Mulligan. I think that's indisputable. But here it is in the five O's and people continue to work on it. And it's kind of waiting for that marquee result. And as soon as it gets it, this should probably be removed from modern because you can't have this existing 
on turn one. And I'm going to say that, but at the same time, there's a lot of other stupid stuff you can do on turn one right now. Like there, there's really good chalice of the void setups. And I feel like we're also starting to see Simeon spirit guide finally being pushed to that kind of broken tier where it belongs. Like this is just free mana and free mana is problematic. And maybe there's a lot more decks that should have been doing Simeon spirit guide stuff this whole time. Oh, but yeah. whatever, that's getting ahead of myself to some degree. This is a turn one deck in a format that should not have turn one decks. And I don't know that I need to say much more beyond that. Uh, if this deck sees any success at all, it should leave the format immediately. Yeah, I agree. I was eagerly clicking on the results from last weekend's classic at SCG Richmond just to see if, you know, the deck broke through the top 16 and it didn't, Did not. but no, but I don't know how many people were playing the deck. I, I think someone, maybe Ali Warfield was asking for a copy of the deck on Twitter, you know, and it, it's just one of those things where it, it was like a week old at the time, basically. Right. So I, I know that I just got my Allosaurus riders in the mail. You know, yeah, so, I'm assuming I, mine are sitting behind me in this huge pile of cards that I have right now. And I, I think a lot of people probably in the same boat just didn't have Allosaurus Riders sitting around. I, I meant to, while we were in Richmond, just kind of walk the modern classic and see if I could spot it anywhere. I, I didn't get the chance to, unfortunately. So I can't tell you how many people uh, were ready to go with Neoform kind of on week one, but it's coming probably. And especially if we go back to the London Mulligan, which... I mean, I I don't know where public opinion is sitting right now. I It seems like a certainty going back just a couple weeks. I feel like the buzz has died down a little bit, maybe in part because of this deck and the problematic things it does. But I also heard a lot of people just saying that they missed the mulligan rule so much when it went away on Magic Online. So it seemed like it had a successful first run and does seem like it's probably coming back at some point. So yeah, the Neoform decks... I mean, even the fair Neoform decks are trying to win on turn three all the time. Like Neoform Devoted Druid stuff is only the teensiest bit more fair than what's actually going on in the Salasaurus Rider deck. So this was a slam dunk print. I think I had it number four on my list of top 10 modern cards, but like probably should have been number two in all honesty. Eh, You think Blast Zone? Karn? Karn. Karn would be my number one. Okay. Uh, it, so, it, it was my number one. That's and I think that's been vetted at this point. It seems to be playing out where I am still comfortable with that as my number one. Yeah, that's fair. Well, let's let's. I had this list typed out, but let's skip around a little bit. Let's talk about Karn, the Great Creator, where its most notable thing to do in modern is grab Mycosynth Lattice out of the sideboard and just lock, like Armageddon your opponent, basically. Yeah, uh, end the game on at almost all points, just on the spot, if you're able to ever get that going. And it's not just a Tron thing. There's this whole host of decks that are actually picking up Karn the Great Creator. And that's the flashy thing to do with it and what's rightfully getting all the press. But the thing you forget a lot of times is just all the answers you can now have in these decks, not to mention just the facial answer of Karn being a stony silence that all these decks can play in their main deck uh affinity is about to take a real hit here and any other kind of you know artifact activated ability deck uh it's going to be tough for it to exist if all of these decks are picking up karn because we're seeing tron play it we're seeing amulet play it which i'm super super disheartened about because i have to go buy a foil microsynth <laughs> lattice and that is an expensive magic card jerry yeah so that's going to happen to me now which isn't great And there's probably a bunch of other weirdo expensive sideboard foils i'm going to have to buy and hardly ever play i find it hard to believe that it's actually good in amulet but the decks that i have seen it in besides amulet are tron mono red prison various eldrazi decks and then things like lantern and i think it's just outright phenomenal in all of those decks why don't you buy it in amulet i I think it's a very real secondary avenue of attack where if you're going to be willing to do something like hive mind i think karn merits the same kind of consideration because it costs like 10 and not six Okay, but there's other things you can do. I mean, there's like Ensnaring Bridge, which is going to matter sometimes, and Crucible of Worlds, and all these other cards that you can possibly find. So it ruins your sideboard, first of all. Like, you you absolutely have to point out that it does do that. Yeah. And obviously, you don't have to go super deep on it, but a lot of the lists I have seen do that, and that 
is typically the reaction people have when you allow them to play with wishes. You know, they just they're like, oh, what about this? What about this weird corner case situation where I might need blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yo, calm down. You're getting bridge or lattice or graveyard hate, you know, 95 percent of the time. Right. Yeah, I I think bottle gnomes is fair, too. But bottle gnomes. Yeah, I think it's fine. Dude, that's not that's not worth it. It's just not like it depends. It to- depends what you're doing with the slot and which deck we're talking about, right? I don't think it's worth sure. it in Amulet. I think there's decks where you can say it's worth it. <sighs> it's just so bad. Like first, you have to cast a four mana card that does nothing, and then you just get a card that is three mana counter their one mana card. Like obviously, if you're doing things like recurring it or whatever, sure, but that is not a thing. I I think you're right that it requires recursive setups where you're casting that card multiple times, but like. You could never have four copies of Bottle Gnomes in your sideboard. Like, think about something weird like, say, Mono Blue Tron, which may have a problematic Mono Red matchup. You couldn't have four copies of Bottle Gnomes in your sideboard for that. But you could certainly have one if you're already carning, and then you can set up, like, Academy Ruins plus Bottle Gnomes. I'm That's not saying not Bottle good. Gnomes is about to take over anything, but it's, like, an, an option these decks have now. That's not even good. You could make an argument for Worm Coil Engine... And, right, and I, I'm starting to see more Worm Coil Engine now. For and sure. Walking Ballista and stuff like that. And I, I think that's fine. But yeah, whatever. I, I think this is part of the problem that people run into when, you know, it's like, oh, your options are limitless. And a lot of people don't even know what to put in their sideboard to begin with, you know? So yeah, that's true. It's it's pretty easy to just fill it out with bullets. And I think the amulet list I saw had like two negates. And then it was like, you know, 10 bullets or whatever. It's oh, like, yeah, that, that's far. <laughs> that's far down the rabbit hole. Regardless, this card is super strong. It is this weird win condition that doesn't actually accomplish much, but, you know, also does some crazy weird stuff if you have your own artifacts in your deck, you know. And yeah, obviously Karn just by itself is great against Affinity and Amulet and all sorts of nonsense. So it, this is a card that you're going to play against. And it is also just going to revitalize a lot of archetypes that people thought were like tier two or tier three that are actually now quite good. Yeah, maybe the scariest one is Mono Red Prison, because I think that deck is super incentivized to go to like a more fast mana centric configuration now, set up very early Chalice on one, uh, also get to a fast Karn where that's meaningful and then just have access to more ensnaring bridge, which is very scary for a lot of decks. So I I think mono red prison might actually be the sleeper deck to benefit the most from this. And does anyone want that to be the deck, which like is really getting a slam dunk inclusion? No, Simeon spirit guide has been on the watch list for a very long time. As it should be. Right. And it is, like you said, it's getting, dangerously close to just get out of here you're yeah. you're doing too much busted stuff and it, it's very telling too that whenever one of these like gristle brand combo decks shows up or even like ad nauseum right it's like there is basically no way for these decks to kill you on the turn that they guide. combo you yeah un- unless they have spirit guide right yep and yeah. i i think neoform would be fine if you made them like have to untap again to kill you yeah, I could buy that. And, you know, Ad Nauseam dies. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Brian. I have mostly let Ad Nauseam go at this point. It, it, it can die if it has to, to uh, smooth the format a, l- a little bit. I, I mean, honestly, looking through this deck dump, I've never had as much of a sense of a format being like on the precipice of falling to de- degeneracy. That's what a lot of these decks feel like. Like things are just about to go completely haywire. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just that cute stage where everyone's doing cute stuff and then the good decks will come and hold this all down. And that's not reflected in Magic Online 5-0s, right? We don't have win percentages of these crazy looking decks. It, it's just a deck dump. So we shouldn't have the alarm bells going off too fervently. But if you look at this deck dump, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This is one unlike any we've ever seen. It's so wild and, and yep. so cool. And then... You know, Modern Horizons comes out shortly-ish, and then things will change again. So who knows? Like, I, I don't know if this this version of Modern from this time period is actually going to get solved in time. That's true. So Karn is great. Uh, the other one that was kind of scary was Ugin's Conjurant, which is a zero mana spirit, which 
then triggers Celestial Kirin to blow up everyone's lands. Because for whatever reason, Celestial Kirin doesn't say non-land. Yeah, it's a cast trigger too. <laughs> so yes. it's not even like an ETB trigger, which is crazy, honestly. And this is one, I think you might be like the cheerleader for this archetype. I haven't seen too much hype around this. And I haven't seen it in the deck dump. Correct me if I'm wrong. Have you seen this one show up yet? No, I haven't. I was disappointed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this seems totally reasonable to me. You basically have the core of an already good spirits deck, and you're just added this busted Armageddon to it, which seems kind of unfair and maybe exactly what that deck needed as a kick in the pants. But you do require a four mana creature to enter the battlefield. There's not really a response window, I'll say that. Yeah, you also have Cavern of Souls. You do have Cavern of Souls, very true. Uh, in a world where we're talking about decks winning on turns one, two, and three, though, are you as excited about this as you were prior no. to the existence of Neoform? No, of course not. Uh, right. Granted, when I started thinking about this in various shells, I was not made aware of the Neoform Allosaurus Rider thing, and now it just seems downright pedestrian to yeah, be trying quaint. to cast Geddon on turn four with like two cards that you have to kind of naturally draw. Yep. So. Should action be taken to some degree, like maybe Spirit Guide gets banned or something, then I think the format will go back to a place where this sort of thing is actually a reasonable thing to try and be doing. Like if if Ugin's Conjurant were legal for MC London, I think people would have experimented with this. Yeah, I could buy that. It, it certainly seems regular modern power level. That's what I would say. It just feels like things are very amped up right now. Yeah. Uh, except, you know, if you get getting done turn three, they have like a noble hierarch or whatever, and you just have nothing. I, I'm pretty sure you're just dead. Like Could most decks, times. Just, yeah, most decks just lose on the spot, which is not very cool either. Yep. Agreed. Uh, next card that has been showing up a lot is blast zone. And I've seen this in dredge, which makes a lot of sense in amulet, which makes a lot of sense in colorless Eldrazi because they had, you know, blink moth nexuses and random right. crappy colorless lands. They could always do better. And blast zone is great. And then I also saw this enabling mono blue control, which I am actually kind of excited to try. Uh, did it, did it have disrupting troll in it? No, but I mean, given how the, the format is kind of fleshed out, I would expect that like, right. Nar Narset, Parter Avails, I think fuels Disrupting Shoal really well, just as being this, you know, card that can give you some pretty deep looks into other spells. And like, obviously you could play Ancestral Vision alongside of it or whatever, but I don't know. The deck was just like some counter spells, some cantrips, Thing in the Ice, Snapcaster, but the mana base had four blessings. Yeah, if this is a real thing... Uh, you can sign me up right now. I mean, mono blue control, that's right up my alley. Uh, not something that I think we've ever seen in modern. And this is kind of like one of the cool things I think that could happen from Blast Zone. One of the more exciting things. I thought this would just see some very spot play in Amulet. The dredge thing, I didn't really think of, but now having seen it, it makes a lot of sense. And the Eldrazi stuff was a no-brainer because like you said, their lands were all terrible for the most part. But getting something like mono blue control to be a player, unexpected consequence, I'll say that. Yeah, the Blast Zone in dredge, I, I think I initially saw it in Ben Friedman's article where he noted that Graf Digger's Cage just never beats you anymore because yeah. you can just keep dredging eventually, dredge loam, cast it, get back blast zone, immediately blow up cage, and then just do whatever you want, like bring back all the blood gas and conflagrate them or whatever. Uh, so I think that that is a reasonable enough angle. And then it's a colorless land, which is not ideal, but you can, you know, take it up to blow up a rest in peace. Obviously killing like a ley line of the void is going to take a lot more time, but you, you have this card that's just very low opportunity cost that deals with the most problematic hate cards. Yeah, I'm sold. I think it's a big pickup for this kind of deck. I wonder if that's the kind of trick that older versions of these dredge decks might eventually get up to, at least as a sideboard response card. It seems cleaner than doing things like Nature's Claim and right. trying to make your mana work that way. Or it helps, you know, like you see a lot of the lists that are like a bunch of nature's claims, some trophies, some ancient grudges, and you just bring in like, you know, six of these cards. Right. And 
now you have Blast Zone where you don't have to bring in a bunch of potentially dead cards or you play a Blast mm-hmm. Zone main deck or whatever, you know? So it helps just make your draws a little bit smoother too. Probably helps you mulligan less. And it, it's also a card that like can't be stubborn denial, can't be thought seized, right? Like right. they just can't deal with that card. Yeah, what decks get really punished by the addition of Blast Zone to the format? Well, as as someone who played humans in MC London, it was pretty nice knowing that I could use Thalia to keep them off Supreme Verdict or like Meddling Mage their Terminus or whatever. And right. now my best draws that include like Aether Vile, Champion of the Parish, it just seems like so much wind gets taken out of your sails when they get to blast on away like two or three one drops, you know? So I'm actually concerned that Blast Zone is very, very good against humans because I finally thought that I found a deck that I could just play in every modern tournament. You know, I was like, oh, I like this deck and I don't think it's going to get worse. And it got a new print in Deputy Detention that I think solved a lot of problems. But now I think it's just back to square one where if Blast Zone does see a decent amount of play in these control decks, it seems very difficult to actually overcome. It's so hard to find a modern deck to fall in love with these days. I know. <laughs> it's it's Brian, a very, very trying, trying time to be a modern connoisseur. Brian, will I ever find true modern deck love no, again? No, Jerry. We, we talked about this. We, we know there's no such thing as true deck love anymore. It died uh, with the printing of, I don't know, some card is probably responsible directly. Teferi Hero of Dominaria? Maybe. I, I think Simeon Spirit Guide, just, we go all the way back to that. That was the last time we could really love anything. Yeah, that's fair. Next up, we have Gideon Blackblade, which is, you know, basically just showing up where you would expect it. Like there are some copies in some Bant decks, some copies in some Naya Zoo decks. Uh, Obviously, the white Death and Taxes type decks play it. I saw one of the lists was a Mox Amber Legends deck that had, Mm -hmm. I I believe, both Gideon and Karn the Great Creator. So that is correct. Man, decks decks are weird. And, you know, God bless all the people out there who are like doing this brewing. I I just absolutely love it. Like these these last couple deck dumps both had me scratching my head, wondering what the hell was going on. And I'm just like, yeah, respect to just every other deck list I saw. No, people are are jamming on magic online right now. And I think if nothing else, kind of the very steep decline of standard play on magic online has opened up the door for a little bit more modern creativity. And if you're if you're bought into Magic Online right now, this is probably the format you're bought in for. Like, there's very little incentive to be a hardcore user of Magic Online and a devoted standard player. Not to say that those people don't still exist, because they do, but I, I think this is really where Magic Online is going to find that its bread is buttered from this point forward as the home of modern for digital play. And it shows with these deck dumps. Yeah, I definitely agree. I ran into basically only good decks. When I was testing for MC London, the queue times weren't ever more than two minutes. Uh, I, I had a pretty reasonable experience trying to play modern on Magic Online. And then, you know, there are 70 people in the standard constructed league and the drafts take 15 minutes for you to find a match and stuff. So, yeah, I, I do agree that modern is the one place probably where people are actually still playing Magic Online with regularity. Yeah, let's hope that keeps up. Next up, we have Vivian, Champion of the Wilds again probably showing up where you just expect it the most in these green creature-based combo decks like Devoted Druid. I've seen it in a few of those lists, not in all of them. And then in the Prime Speaker Vanifar decks, which I think are nonsense, but whatever. I think they want Birthing Pod back very badly and uh, Vanifar just ain't it for the most part. But I, I do think Vivian makes that deck quite a bit better. Being able to do your stuff at instant speed is... A very big game changer. It was also a big get for the standard versions of the Vanifar decks, which I still oh, think yeah. are solidly tier two, but getting closer. And it only takes one print to blow that style of deck wide open. So I, I would keep a close eye on Vanifar as we move through the standard format. I know it saw some uh, MCQ success over the past week, and it's close. It's very close. I've played against it a few times. It's much more impressive than previous versions were. And Vivian's a huge part of that. And that's definitely going to play with the modern versions as well. Yep. As for Devoted Druid, these decks are getting scarier and scarier because, like I said, Neoform fit into one of these decks. And yep. so you have another tutor, which is, is basically just that. It is it is a tutor. You're going to have some Birds of Paradise lying around. You can 
yeah, I don't know. You're just going to have a bunch of creatures, obviously. And then Vivian gives you like this draw engine. People have started uh, adopting post-mortem lunge. So even if they kill your devoted druid, you can still bring it back with haste and combo off basically whenever. So these decks are getting scary too. Yeah. So one of the things too, that I think gets slept on a little bit is like the obvious use of Neoform is to set up your devoted druid kill. And that's certainly a lot of what it's doing, but there's also this insidious usage of, as well, where your hate bears, if you will, whatever creature based hate you have, lurking either in your sideboard or main deck is online even earlier than it was previously and having more reliable access to those cards also a really big impact for these deck especially with this large card pool where you often do have good options against pretty much anything your opponent's doing you can hate graveyards you can hate combo play with dahlia you could do all these different things and these decks now have access to that option more reliably and a little bit earlier in the game Although, you know, a lot of times Noble Hierarch, some kind of mana dork is part of the equation. So you're able to get Eldritch Evolution going a little bit. But still, eight copies means that you'll always be able to set up those hate bear lines. They're not yep. just a once in a while thing. Next, we have uh, Teferi Time Raveler and Narset Parter of Veils. If y'all have been paying any attention whatsoever to formats that are not standard, you would have seen these cards popping up a lot in blue control decks, both in modern and in legacy. And I don't think that's a fluke. I think that Narset in legacy is something that I am very, very excited to actually try out. And Agreed. to fairy to fairy time raveler to a smaller degree, but also these Azorius control decks in modern now just have like this insane suite of planeswalkers that are able to give them card advantage and also function as defensive tools too. 100%. Narset's absolutely insane. Less excited about Teferi. We often talk about modern being two ships passing in the night. In that case, you don't care all that much about Teferi messing up your opponent's timings. Uh, it doesn't do quite as much as it does in its standard incarnation, but Narset is the real deal. Like Phoenix decks just stare at you. And there's the line of play Narset pass just do nothing with it and then phoenix decks just can't get their cantrip sweet online they need double lightning bolt to deal with it so this card checks a very powerful powerful tier one deck uh, authoritatively and then there's this weird tension in modern of it being a format of really low casting costs but still wanting these persistent card advantage engines and that's why teferi found such success is that it was a quasi three mana planeswalker like you were able to do the really powerful thing but also keep up mana on that critical turn narset's just going to play on an earlier turn and that's really what these decks have been missing in a lot of instances having a ludicrously effective three mana planeswalker big deal for these control decks and honestly i think these control decks have been improving quite a bit recently um blue white control is probably better going into london than it's been a very long time Agreed. This kind of hyper aggressive turn one, turn two format doesn't suit blue eye control really well. But if things slow down a little bit, I think Narset could very well put it in the top tier again. And it's been a while since I've said that in good faith about blue white. So I'm certainly excited for that to happen. Yeah, same. And then you also have Narset causing price spikes on weird cards like Days Undoing. Right. And you see Narset being the focal point of this disrupting shoal commandeer Days Undoing deck, which is obviously super wild and i uh, love to see that i'm not sure you know how good that deck is i'm i think it's not great but like you have disrupting shoal you probably have a good allosaurus rider matchup right so that's got to count for something yeah you could also do like weird wheel of fate stuff and use you know electro dominance or maybe the next card we're about to talk about oh no no, no that's the wrong that's the wrong finale i get a, i get these two mixed up still we can change it, man. You want to skip ahead? Yeah, yeah. let's go ahead. Let's talk about All Finale right. of Promise. Yeah, so this is the red one. And the obvious home for this is in Arclight Phoenix decks. And I do like this because if you're playing some sort of attrition-y matchup, like Jund or Blue Eye Control or something, and even like Grixis Death Shadow, I guess, too. Like, this is, this is it. This brings back your Phoenix's 4-1 card and is also just a divination, basically. So... Unless they are really hating on your graveyard, this is a, a fine card to play like one or two copies of. Do you think it's necessary, though? 
Like uh, I get what you're saying in the attrition matchups, but as a main deck inclusion, like just to be uh, part of your default plan, it just feels to me like your cantrips so often draw into other cantrips and the the whole one spell, get all your stuff going is appealing for sure, but maybe somewhat unnecessary in these decks. That's my concern. I think it is more reasonable in mono red Phoenix than it is in blue red Phoenix. Right. But I wouldn't necessarily fault someone for playing it as a one of in blue red, but okay. in, in mono red, I definitely want one and maybe two copies depending on, you know, what spells I'm playing and what kind of diversity between instants and sorceries I have. And what is the likelihood of me having access to like both of them in the post board games and stuff like that? You know, like I, if I'm playing this card, I want it to be on every single time. Okay. That makes sense. And like I was mentioning previously too, this is another way to cast those zero mana spells from yep. time spiral, ancestral vision, living end, restore balance and wheel of fate, which I mentioned there just seems to be like a critical enough mass where you could do some kind of narset, Wheel of Fate, Electro Dominance, Finale, Ancestral Vision, and then you're somehow holding this together with some glue. I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but it feels like there's so many redundant options to get access to these cards now. Something has to break eventually. Yeah, I agree. It, I mean, it's definitely scary stuff. Like people look at Dredge and it's like, oh, they put 10 power onto the battlefield on turn two. This is too good. And then you think about what Finale is capable of doing even like the electro dominance living index, you know, like the, the mono red living end deck, like this card has to help that deck. Absolutely. And what potentially, so? potentially makes it like a turn faster too. And more consistent. It's like that stuff is legit scary because you just die. They or a brass attack you for 20, you know? <laughs> yeah. Good game. Another one of those super fun turn two kills, which are becoming more and more commonplace in modern, but like modern always, this just has to happen, right? Like this is the only conceivable way for a card pool that gets larger and larger to behave is that it has to scale more powerfully as time goes, time goes on. Right. Yeah. I mean, they can certainly not print cards that are like, you know, tutor for creatures or cast spells from your graveyard or, you know, things no, like that. I know some of these seem obvious, but some of them seem very hard. Like, like your card U Ugin's conjure. And I don't think anyone had that on a watch list when it was being talked about. No, of course not. I mean, why the hell would you print a zero mana spirit? Like right. if, if they wanted to safeguard against that, they could just put non land on celestial Kieran, but it just didn't make any sense because at the time they just weren't planning on doing that. And also what are the odds that 15 years later, there ends up being a format where both of those cards would be legal. Right. So, yeah. Well, let's talk about the other finale finale of devastation. I don't really like this card just because of how expensive and cumbersome it is, but I guess the fact that, that it is seeing play in decks like Devoted Druid, and I saw uh, one of the 5 decks was an Elves combo deck that Green Sun Zenith should maybe stay banned? I don't know. That's that's the one card I think that people turn to a lot of the time when they're just like, yo, why is this on the ban list? Well, I, I've always said that I think it needs to remain on the ban list as long as Dryad Arbor doesn't take its place. And that's a I fair would take. Also be, I would be totally fine with Dryad Arbor being banned and Green Sun coming off, but... Uh, yeah, the inclusion of this card, you get it. We keep talking about redundancy and being able to have multiple versions of the same effect. And this is just more tutor action for these decks, which are very capable of generating large amounts of mana. So you can see why they're buying in. I, I think on its face, it is expensive. I totally agree with what you're saying. Kind of a hard sell to get me to pay, you know, three mana for my one drop. That doesn't sound all that appealing, but where your one or two drop just wins the game, it's a lot more palatable. And that's the setup that we're dealing with here. So I think this will continue to see play. I don't think it did anything to really elevate these decks, though. I think they're just kind of keeping pace with the rest of the format, not pushing into something new and broken. What are your thoughts on Splinter Twin and Standard, though, Jerry? Have have you been up to date <laughs> with this deck? Yeah. Uh, was it like Rao copy finale? First finale gets Narumiha, that copies mm -hmm. finale, and then... Mm -hmm. Since Finale searches the graveyard, you just go infinite and rail them to death. Yep, that's it. It's hilarious. It is really funny. I, I don't think it's, you know, like particularly good or anything, but it is cool. I, I like it better than like Ral 
twin cast setups for the most part. And I'm talking like actual twin cast, not just the incidental RAL. I play expansion explosion in my team or reclamation deck. This combo seems a little bit stronger than that one, but that one also wasn't very good to begin with. So I, I think this is probably like squarely tier two, which is good because this is not the type of deck that people would be happy to lose to over and over and over. Yeah, it's a tame version of Felidar Sahili. Yep, sounds right to me. And that is completely fine with me. I mean, you need to be three colors of mana. You need to play Naramiya in your deck. That's completely fine. Huge cost in playing that card, for sure. Uh, next up, we have Dreadhorde Arcanist. And I think this is one of the cards that people uh, immediately pointed to when they thought about Modern. And I think for good reason. It does do a lot of the same stuff that we talked about with Finale of Promise, where... It, you can cast like Ancestral Vision from your graveyard. And uh, even if you're talking about playing it in a more fair setting, you're like casting Lightning Bolts and Ops and maybe Faithless Lootings with this thing. And I've seen it show up in uh, a single Arclight Phoenix deck, I think, that was very close to Mono Red, had Mutagenic Growth, and Become Immense, because Become Immense in this card is kind of a combo. Yeah, that's an interesting one get real big with your become immense and get your become immense back uh to do a whole bunch of damage interesting interesting stuff i want this card to be good in the fair context so badly i want to thought seize my opponent cast this card and then thought seize my opponent again i want to fatal push creatures with it i just want it to be like a new dark confidant and no part of me at all believes that's what modern is about at this moment. I just no. don't think it's realistic. So uh, I hope things settle down to a place where we get to see some fair Dread Horde Arcanist decks. I don't know if I believe that's ever going to happen, though, given the state of things presently. Yeah, I think a few cards would have to get banned. Right. Definitely wholesale format changes before we're <laughs> dealing with our fair Arcanist decks. But, you know, I will hold on to hope because that is the type of magic that really sold me on modern in the first place. Like Jund gets a lot of gruff these days, but I, I do think that on the whole, when Jund was a deck in modern format, probably a little bit more in line with what they intended it to be. I'll say that. Yep. And I would be fine if that were the case, but as time goes on, we get further and further away from that reality. Next card is Dovin's veto, which is pretty simple showed up in some Azorius control list. Basically, anywhere you would play Negate, you can probably play this card. And doesn't alter a whole lot, except against Ad Nauseam, it just makes their Pact of Negations worthless, which is kind of cool. Yeah, nice little upside. Next one is Davriel, Rogue Shadow Mage, showing up where you would expect in the old... Uh, they, they call it A-Rack... They've been playing seven recently. Now it's ten, ten rack. Yeah. I Very guess. number of rack, as it'll soon be called. Not as catchy of a name, but true, because Davriel is a card. I don't think there's ever been a more tailor-made card for an archetype than Davriel. Again, I think it's one of those things where the card just kind of lets that deck hold the status quo. I don't think it pushed into a new tier with the addition of this card. Uh, but maybe it just hasn't had enough time to shake out yet. We'll have to see as long as there's redundant combo kills on turns two and three untargeted discard like this, a little bit of a hard sell, but we'll see if it eventually finds a home. Next card is Liliana's triumph, which is a slight upgrade to legacy, but in the context of modern, we didn't really have a two mana instant speed edict. So I saw this showing up in a couple spots, but I don't think this is really a format where for two mana you need specifically an edict effect. There aren't any merit lage tokens or anything, right. but it is nice to have access to this. And certainly there are plenty of playable Lilianas in modern. So another little nice upside there. Yeah. Like you said, just not as much what modern is about. There's no true name nemesis. There's no 2020s on the battlefield. That's probably good. But as it stands, that means there won't be a ton of Liliana's Triumph floating around, which is fine. It's there if we need it. And then the last two are just kind of jokes. Uh, Nimbus is Reborn, which we alluded to earlier, like bring delighting for this thing. And it's like, yeah, sure, whatever. But if you have picked up on where we think modern is going, you would probably not think that 
a five mana sorcery that just like draws cards is good enough for modern. And I would agree with that. Yeah, totally agree. But uh, I mean, how could you not give props for <laughs> this deck building? Uh, this is some off the wall stuff. Uh, if you haven't seen the five color Niv Mizza deck, of course, you could head over to Magic Online deck list and take a look. I know a lot of times people listening don't necessarily know where to get these deck lists. They're just posted on the mothership. It's literally go to your Google machine, type in Magic Online deck list. It'll bring you right there. It should be part of your repertoire. If you're not looking at these decks every day, you're missing a very important source of information that a lot of your fellow players are looking at. So add that to your bookmarks. Make sure you're checking that out. It's just inspiration for you. More upside, you'll know what's going on in the format more regularly. Yeah, and I'm going to try and tweet out some of these deck lists, like the the more weird ones, both the, the Pongify one and the niv Mizid deck came from my homie. So obviously got to shout him out for 5 0 twice in a, a short time frame with just sick brews yeah yeah definitely make sure to get those up on the arena decklist account they deserve it and then the last one is spark double which we haven't even seen a lot of people trying in standard which is weird because it seems pretty strong and you you were the one who jumped all over this card during preview season and wrote an article about it and I don't know, this just showed up in a Sultai deck with Jace Vrin's Prodigy and like Liliana, Garrick Relentless. Again, this just seems like kind of nonsense given where Modern is right now. Yeah, a bit too slow. I am happy to see this card get some run though. Copying Planeswalkers can get very silly very quick. And I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, John Rolfe attempting to do Planeswalker-based stuff in Standard. Spark Double also an inclusion there. I know Arena Decklist tweeted that one out, so make sure you check out that deck as well if you're looking for cool Spark Double Homes. I, I'll be honest, when I was writing my article, I don't think I expected to see it make headway in modern, and maybe it won't. No, maybe this is just a of flash course in the pan, not. But uh, yeah, weird, weird times in modern. That's for sure. Wild West, man. Yep. Well, out of out of these 16 cards, which one are you most excited by? It's It's got to be... Well, okay. The one I most want to be excited by is Dreadhorde Arcanist. Like I said, I playing that in a fair context would just, it would be awesome. That's the type of magic I love. I can visualize the deck in my head and I know exactly what I want it to do and how I want the games to play out. And it's just not realistic. And I know that. So that's the one I want to be most excited about. But the, the real slam dunk, I think just has to be Karn. Uh, I think it's such a great option for so many decks. And the problem is the decks it's making better are not going to be your favorite decks to play against. I will guarantee you that right now. It's not going to be super fun when Tron is Mycosynth latticing you out of the game. But here we are. It's it's Karn's time to shine. I, I will mention briefly too. So I think I really nailed my top 10 modern cards. The only one which has not seen any play is Sahili. Does that surprise you at all? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I guess there are similar effects in Young Pyromancer and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. if you're looking for a three mana blue planeswalker, you have things like Narset and Teferi already. So I think Sahili will show up eventually, but it's not surprising that it's currently on the back burner, considering that there's a bunch of other sweet stuff to do. Yeah. And again, we keep coming back to this point, so it feels a little redundant, but Sahili is an inherently fair card. Like it's not doing busted stuff. It's not single-handedly shutting down your opponent's strategies or taking over the game. It's just making some tokens. And in this world, I'm not sure that's actually what you want to be doing presently. Well, it's possible that there's a way to actually abuse the the minus two, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. the copy to do something. I don't know what, but put put Cave Dan on that. He'll figure it out. Oh yeah. Well, I I think that's about it. I. I am very wary about modern for the next month or so. And then modern horizons will be coming out at some point, And then we'll have a bunch of other nonsense to deal with. And I, I think that it is going to take a lot of time before modern is actually figured out again. So maybe what I should be doing is probably not getting like upset or frustrated by the, the fact that things like Neoform exist or like, you know, Karn is getting Mycosynth Lattice or whatever. It's just like, enjoy the ride. 
basically. Yeah, enjoy it while it lasts is what I would say. And actually, you and I are going to get firsthand look at New Modern when we head to Louisville uh, on May 25th for the SCG Tour. It's going to be something. And that is, in fact, a modern event. And we'll see if it's just a bunch of turn two kills all day or if we're being a little uh, panicky and hyperbolic. But I get the sense this is a very, very fast format right now. I don't think it's going to be a bunch of turn two kills, but I do think that things like Karn and Narset are just going to lead to a lot of people not playing Magic one way or the other. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens. Looking forward to it regardless. It's, you know, whether it turns out to be the best metagame or not, there's still all this stuff to learn and digest as we go down that road and figure out exactly where we're going to settle. Even if the end result is not the type of magic we want to be playing, I still think there's lessons to take away. So we'll see him in Louisville, that's for sure. Word. So every week, We solicit the fine folks in our Discord for a question that has something to do with uh, the week's cast. And we'll select uh, one of the questions, read it on the air, answer it and everything. And then that person will get uh, some fine vintage game podcast sleeves. We're running low, though. For For now. now. That'll change. We'll have to figure out uh, something else to do at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're the. It's also the Arena Decklist Discord now. Another change. So the question we chose this week comes from Oberon, and Oberon asks, "How drastic of a meta shift do you predict Modern Horizons to be? Ideally, how much would you like it to change?" And I think that's kind of interesting, especially in the context of this episode, where there are sixteen cards that have seen play in modern over the course of the last few days from war of the spark which was not even necessarily meant to impact modern and i would expect that modern horizons given that it's like you know 250 cards that were not previously legal in modern and kind of meant to at least have some of them see play in modern like it's going to be a big change i think i don't think it's necessarily going to have like a super crazy impact and make modern not necessarily feel like modern anymore, but I would expect there to hopefully be new decks and metagame shifts and cool new archetypes to work on and stuff like that. uh, Assuming that the the cards actually hit, you know? So Jerry, do you ever write something just be like, this is a perfect summation of how I feel right now. And I am proud of this one blurb of words that i have put together like does that ever hit you no i think my writing sucks people seem to like it so i feel the exact same way except in (laughs) one instance where i wrote about the tension of modern horizons and it's only like two paragraphs in an article and it's one i wrote a while ago but i remember after i wrote it i was like this really accurately and clearly expresses how i feel about the topic and i thought it was like a a very nuanced and good take. And please allow me to pat myself on the back this one time because I hate everything else I've ever written. I promise. Everything else is trash. But this one paragraph I thought was good. And and basically I said there was this extreme tension between designing modern horizons for the modern that exists and designing modern horizons for what you actually endeavor to make modern. Because the modern that exists is this hyperlinear beast. And again, to go back to the two ships passing in the night thing, that's true. And a lot of people use that as a knock on modern. And that's fine. Everyone has different priorities, different play styles they like. But there's no denying that modern rose to a point of incredible popularity pretty much with that as the play style, like that two ships passing in the night thing, it wasn't something the majority of the player base hated. They adopted it wholesale and modern, and and maybe this is changing with the advent of arena, but if you go back just a year, modern was by far the most popular magic format, way more popular than standard. It wasn't even close. And it did so being this two ships passing in the night format. So (laughs) if you're designing modern horizons, are you leaning into that? Like, are you trying to make these linear experiences in some way better? Or are you trying to rein things in and get things back to the place where you can play a fair Dreadhorde Arcanist deck? 
And the fact of the matter is I have no idea how to answer that question. I have no idea what the right answer to that question is. And I have no idea how Wizards sees that question. So I, I guess I just don't know. Like, what's the point of doing this set if you're not going to shake things up in some way? Right. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I can't see you shaking up things in a way that modern has historically embraced. Like if you're trying to accomplish anything, it feels to me like you just want to move things back to the middle, back to a more fair style of magic. And if you look at the first few cards we saw, we only saw have seen two at this point. But I got the sense that that's exactly what those cards were. They were for a world where you could have some more interaction. And quite frankly, if both those cards existed right now, I'm not sure either would see any play whatsoever. And I'm, of course, of course, talking about Cabal Therapist and the Sarah Planeswalker, they definitely don't fit with the present modern context we're dealing with in my eyes. So it'll be really interesting to see how many cards are like that and a little bit fairer and just get squeezed out by this incredible confluence of these weird printings coming together to make these hyper linear hyper consistent turn two turn three decks and how much the set actually succeeds in moving things a bit back to the middle which is i guess that's what i hope happens we get closer to a more fair interactive style of magic i think that would be cool but i don't think that what you said i i don't think that that is what would attract more people to modern. I agree. I think that people do like the, I just do my thing. You mm -hmm. do your thing. We interact like a little bit, maybe a couple times, but for the most part, we just see who wins, right? If it were up to me, I think my approach to design for magic sets in general is basically just make a bunch of cool toys and then let people figure it out. And I, Obviously, you have to balance a little bit and make sure that it's in line with kind of what you want the format to look like as far as like, you know, length of game and how much interaction there is and stuff like that. But realistically, I think if you just design cards that are current modern power level and you just make a bunch of cool stuff and then just let it loose on the wild, like I, th I think that is just a reasonable approach because even for trying to, you know, like I worked in FFL on standard and it wasn't so much about just like, okay, what do we want this format to look like exactly? Mm -hmm. It was just like, let's make some cards. Let's build some decks. Let's play them against each other. Is this fun to play with? Are these cards balanced? And then just you, you release it, you know? And for modern, you just, you can't even test all the decks. You can't test right. all the interactions. I think it is very likely that something breaks. I mean, you see stuff like Neoform in just a standard set, right? Like, obviously, stuff like that is probably going to be in Modern Horizons too. It won't surprise me if cards from that set end up getting banned or causing cards to get banned, you know? So I, I do think the landscape is going to change. Maybe the decks that are currently the best decks now will not be the best decks in three months or whatever. But I don't think the format is either going to speed up or slow down dramatically because I, I feel like there's so much self-correcting that is possible to do in the modern format. Mm -hmm. And especially with this set, I feel like one of the, the constant complaints is that, you know, some things just don't have enough hate cards or whatever, or like, you know, I can't hate on this thing in this color, or I don't have a card that, hates on graveyards that I can play in my main deck reasonably and stuff like that. So I think you might see more things like that. It'll be interesting to see. And I also think my argument like kind of ignores the question of, is it even possible to put the genie back into a bottle and try and move things to a more fair place? Like I I'm sitting here saying that as a goal and I can't tell you exactly how you would achieve that. Like it seems like a very trying task to do when the card pool is as big as modern's is. Your approach makes sense, like more main deckable uh, kind of hate cards. But then like you don't just want the format to be hate bears the format like that doesn't sound very fun to me. So uh, basically, I'm going to sit back, shut up and enjoy the ride and take whatever I am given in Modern Horizons. I'm excited for it. I think no matter how it shakes up, it'll be a lot of fun unpacking it. And I mean, you see how much fun something like War of the Spark, which had 16 cards that hit proved to be uh so you know i don't think it's unrealistic to expect this to have 
30, 40 cards that hit out of the 200. And if that's the world we're living in, then things are just going to go bonkers and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Yep. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, that is kind of my favorite part in Magic, right? Is like the new set and brewing. And I think that for a format like Modern, where everything has mostly stayed the same, like obviously there are metagame shifts and, you know, maybe people adopt like a couple new cards from each new expansion that comes out. But like for for the most part, it's like we're we're playing the same decks, like Tron, Humans, whatever, that we've been playing for a while now. And I think that Horizons will dramatically change that probably by giving us some new decks and certainly making current decks a lot better. Uh, maybe giving us ways to beat up on dredge and stuff like that. I don't know. But yeah. How, how much would I want modern to change? I don't know. Like I, even for my selfish reason, like I don't, I'm, I'm actually just like fine with modern and how it is now. I used to be like a very staunch modern hater and now Same. I'm just a, I'm okay with it. It's it's cool. Uh, I I do wish that I had just a deck that I loved playing and was fine, but I feel like that's going to go out the window for at least the next three months. And you know, maybe maybe I'll find true deck love or whatever. But just for all the people out there who do love modern and love what it is currently, I would not want the feel of the format to change that much. Yeah, yeah. I think you kind of have to accept it for what it is. And one of the most pronounced parts of getting older is just realizing everything's not for you and uh (laughs) there's there's certain parts of modern which are very much not for me but people love it and that's what really matters and i will keep participating in it keep keep enjoying it even if it's not the optimal format i dream of it being it's fine it's totally acceptable and in the meantime you can enjoy the fact that you have a standard mcq this weekend uh, air quotes enjoy aka fret and dread and try desperately to figure out exactly what esper 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 yeah yeah it, all right it's locked esper's locked we'll figure it out hell yeah all right the show's done and we are no longer the game podcast how should we sign ourselves out uh, this is a thing that i did not consider yeah we we are literally figuring this out live how about like let me get a look at that deck list well, that would be the worst sign out ever. Don't don't take that. Right. Also, we just looked at all the deck lists. Right. <laughs> what do you got for me? I got nothing, man. I If you want to say that's game, I'm fine with that. I don't really care. Can that be like the thing we keep? That'll be our shout out. Always. We, we are happy to get where we're going, but we always want to acknowledge our past. Or it can be a placeholder until we figure out something better. Okay. That's game. Good luck.